All right. Well, thanks, folks, for being here for this month's sustainability series. Um, we're really excited to welcome Katie Jones uh, to talk about a pretty interesting and exciting project she's working on the Twin Cities, um, a, a straw bale home um, infill redevelopment project that she's working on. Um, so very excited to welcome her. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, I don't know, meeting, running of the meeting things to go through. Um, as Katie's working through the presentation, if you could just type questions in the chat and I'll try to find a natural pause to introduce those. Um, we'll also have plenty of time at the end to answer any questions. And then afterwards, as always, we'll share a recording of the, the event and the slides too that we'll review today. Um, but with that out of the way, I'll get out of the way too. Um, and welcome Katie and, and thanks again, Katie, for being here uh, to speak with mm -hmm. us today. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Kevin. And thanks for, uh, you know, giving me the opportunity to share a bit about our build. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, from gas to grass, um, passive uh, straw bale home building in the city. Um, so like I said, my name is Katie Jones. Um, my husband and I, so Peter Schmidt, we uh, both are clean energy nerds. And so um, naturally, when we thought about building our own home, we wanted it to be as energy efficient and as carbon neutral as possible. So that's a little bit of background about us. Um, I also want to give acknowledgement to our team um, that we've been working with and could not have done this done this project without. Um, Precipitate Architecture, they're a, a passive house uh, focused um, a female led architecture firm and they're awesome would highly recommend a squared design they're our contractor and have been uh, willing to do weird things <laughs> um, so I really appreciate them and then Andrew Morrison has been our straw bale expert um, and got to know him um, through strawbale.com so today I'm going to go through five main areas, um, the motivations of our project, uh, why straw, um, talk about the components of a straw bale building, um, how uh, we were able to navigate approvals and hopefully set a new precedent, um, walk through the build itself, uh, and then um, talk about a little bit of the math, um, like kind of some summary items. So to start some inspiration, um, kind of on the bottom left here, uh, my husband and I both attended uh, Waldse, which is the Concordia Language Village's German summer camp up in Bemidji um, for a number of years as kids. And uh, that's actually where the first passive house, um, certified passive house that was built in North America. And as a kid, I got to actually um, uh, plant the plants on top of the building. So I'm the third uh, kid there um, on the right. Um, later on in our lives, so, you know, it, I guess from camp, you know, we got inspired about like, hey, it's possible to, to do more sustainable design. And this is what a building looks and feels um, like um, when it comes to passive house. Um, from there, um, we both studied abroad in Freiburg, Germany, and so on the top left, um, this building, um, it's called the Solar Schiff, uh, it was actually just across the street from where we lived, so it was a you know, highly sustainable building um, uh, with a lot of solar um, power in it. And then on the bottom right, when we studied uh, or when we taught English in Austria, um, I was working with a group that actually went on a field trip to a building called the S House near Vienna. And it was, it's a, um, a straw bale office building. And this is some of the, um, a, a picture of it in construction. So that was kind of some of the background. And so um, when we thought about uh, building a house here in Minneapolis, uh, we, you know, had that inspiration. And then we also wanted to look like what, what's happening here locally. So um, the, uh, a passive house in Northeast um, called the Northeast Nest, um, was a good example and we toured that um, in the neighborhood next door. There's a net zero um, retrofit building. Um, you can see that Victorian house in the middle. And then also came across this over 20 year old straw bale building in North Branch. Uh, and so we knew that straw bale was possible um, to get approved in the state. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another um, major motivation was just like from our experience decarbonizing our uh, triplex so that we've been doing over six years now. Um, we've shown almost 80% carbon reduction um, through a number of projects, including insulation and air sealing. Uh, we have solar on top. Um, you can see in a lot of these pictures here, this was part of our exterior retrofit um, that we ended up doing in order to make the building um, tighter. Um, to be able to be heated electrically because, you know, 1893 building, not, not that uh, well insulated. 
Um, and then you can see some of the, um, the runs of piping here. Those are um, the refrigerant lines for our air source heat pumps. So, uh, you know, our main motivations are really around decarbonization. And here are, here's kind of our project goals and a little bit of context of the, uh, the, the location, the site where this building is. So I'll stop, stop, start maybe here with the map. So you can see here's a map of kind of the downtownish area of Minneapolis. Uh, our location is in Uptown, just southwest of downtown. So we're less than a mile from downtown. Um, and we know that, you know, this building may not stand for the next hundred years and, and that's okay, you know, cities develop. And so one of my goals was to make sure that if this building is torn down, how can it be as, you know, cradle to cradle as possible um, or cradle to soil as possible? Um, and thinking about, well, what can be composted? What can be recycled from this, from this building? Um, it is on an urban lot. You know, it's a 45 foot um, uh, front uh, lot and about um, 134 feet uh, long. There's an existing dwelling. So this is the triplex that I'm sitting in right now. And uh, we removed the garage and the building is going in the back here, um, the back um, of the property. So the project goals are to have a small footprint. Um, that is one way, you know, from uh, lifestyle to, um, to reduce carbon as well. Having that be an infill, uh, accessory dwelling unit or cluster development. A cluster development is just what was most advantageous for us per our zoning. Um, we do not own a car. And so we wanted this building to be as walking, biking and transit friendly as possible. Um, so I'll talk about our bike room. Um, we wanted to make sure to use low carbon materials so that embedded carbon, oh, we wanted to have that low. Wanted to use passive house design because there's a lot of good uh, best practices there that can help us achieve the, uh, the goals above as well as the the last goal, which was net zero energy construction and operation. So um, to just give a, a quick vantage point of the house, um, it's two and a half story, um, about 1500 square feet. Here's just a quick snapshot from our architecture firm um, that kind of shows some of the continuous insulation and the air tightness. Uh, but I wanted to point out uh, a couple of features here. So here on the bottom um, is where uh, we have our bike room. We don't have a, a a garage. Instead, this is where we'll store our bikes. Um, and the bedrooms are actually on the first floor, bedrooms and main bathroom are on the first floor, um, because we honestly couldn't figure out how to find, figure out a, an open concept floor plan um, and fit the bike room in on the, the size lot that we had, the, the footprint that we could literally fit the building in given the setback requirements. So the, the living space is actually on the second floor. And so you can see like kind of kitchen area up there and there is a half loft, um, which will become Peter's perch or my husband's <laughs> hangout space. So um, moving into the next section of why straw, um, you can see this building uh, right here. It's, it is actually a straw bale building. It's over hundred years old. It's the first documented um, building uh, in the US to be built out of straw bale. And actually straw bale started in the US because we um, invented the, um, the straw baler. Um, and especially in the plains, uh, there isn't a lot of tree, there aren't a lot of trees and uh, stacking bales on top of one another like you do bricks um, seemed like a very uh, resource um, effective method. And so here's a building that we know that has stood the test of time. Um, it has uh, it is weatherproofed um, with plaster on either, either side. And I'll talk a little bit more about the construction in a bit. But Learning about the fact that these buildings exist and have, have been durable over time really has given me, um, gave me the confidence to start at least exploring why we should look in a straw. So a straw bale building um, is essentially straw bales sandwiched in between plaster. And you can do that in two different ways. Um, there's a load bearing structure or a post and beam structure. Load bearing are, are just as it says, so the bales are literally the, the, the they handle the load or the, the weight of the roof and everything else of the building. You can typically only build one story tall with a load bearing straw bale assembly. Uh, with a post and beam structure, you're you know, using four by fours uh, essentially to create that structure and you fill in the walls with, um, with straw bale. Um, in both cases, you use a, uh, you, you kind of sandwich um, the bales with a, a wire mesh. And on top of that goes the, 
uh, the plaster. And the plaster and the mesh together really function as they're a structural unit that um, prevents shear um, and which is a key component for, um, for housing um, you know, stability. Straw bale construction is now recognized in the International Construction Code in Appendix S. S. And so now that there are best practices um, set out there and they're official, that also gave me confidence in moving forward with this type of bailing or this type of construction. And finally, I, you know, did some infield research. Uh, I looked to find a, um, a straw bale workshop and found one in Seattle through strawbale.com. Again, this is Aaron, Andrew Morrison's group and actually learned like, what is the science behind it? Um, how, are, how do you mitigate uh, potential issues? What have the best practices been to, you know, that have been developed over time? And so it was a really good experience to uh, make sure that, uh, you know, crossing my T's, dotting my I's, uh, that this would be this would function in um, in our situation. So some of the benefits of straw bale, I'm going to run through seven real quick here. Um, the first is is I think people find surprising is that it's a very fire resistant uh, building method. Uh, on the bot bottom left here, you can see a case study of a building in California that survived. There's actually multiple of these buildings, but here's just one of a building in California that survived um, one of the campfires in, or I think it was 2017. Um, and it's because, so straw bale is really resistant to uh, temperature change because it's got that thermal mass. And you can see here, 18, it's an 18 uh, inch depth bale. Um, and so it, it doesn't readily change temperature. And then the plaster on the exterior, it's essentially sand and lime. <laughs> and so those are not things that readily catch fire. And because of those two things, um, the, the tests from uh, Oak Ridge National, National Labs um, give it give this construction type a two hour fire rating. Um, in most construction, like the, this code is one hour fire rating. Uh, another benefit is the soundproofness. Uh, um, it's because the the not stiff layers um, and it, it give it um, you know it absorbs sound essentially, and it's got that sufficient mass that also allows it to um, absorb sound. Some other benefits. Um, Straw is a waste product. So some uh, important thing to, to note is the distinction between hay and straw. We're banging with straw bales, not hay bales. Uh, hay is actually, it's a nutritional um, a product. It's got the seed head and that's something that animals use. So it's animal feed. The straw is just this leftover stock after the seed head and all of the, the valuable things are removed from, um, from the crop. So really it's a waste product. I mean, it's used as bedding and other things like that, but it's not, um, it doesn't have a high high value in the marketplace. So we get to reuse um, waste. Uh, it also has very low embedded energy. So when you compare it to other insulation types, you can see here um, from cellulose to fiberglass to EPS foam, which is one of the, the nicer foams. Um, it's, it's energy uh, uh, per kilogram of carbon is really low. It also sequesters carbon, or so that, that's the embodied energy to you know um, to harvest it and deliver it. That's that's what that energy takes. Um, but on the other side, it also sequesters carbon of 26 pounds per bale. And did some quick math that it that our house will sequester 9,000 pounds of carbon, which is equivalent to driving um, 10,000 uh, miles or five acres of a forest and the amount of CO2 they um, take in a in a year. The other benefit is that it can be a community building project. Uh, so I'll get to that in a little bit here. Um, I did want to note that it doesn't really matter which straw you use. Um, they, they, um, the carbon sequestration on the embodied energy properties, uh, as well as the insulative properties, don't change a whole lot um, the, uh, depending upon the, um, the, the type. So a lot of questions I get asked are, you know, kind of along the lines of the three little pigs, like the big bad wolf coming in. What about pests? What about mold? You know, all these things. So um, I'd like to address those up front. First, uh, pests. Um, yes, mice like to live in straw, but if they can't get in in the first place, then there shouldn't be no issues. Also, straw bales are really, really compact. So they, um, it's hard for any, um, 
critters to get in there. And so, you know, as long as you have well sealed plastered walls and we've got three layers of plaster on either side, um, that should be no issue. Uh, so when it comes to electrical, plumbing and moisture, we have um, solutions for that. Uh, electrical cables can actually just be buried directly in the bales. Um, there's no harm in that um, as long as they're UFB cable. Um, plumbing, however, does need to be kept out of the walls. Um, the biggest danger to, or biggest risk to, to straw bale is moisture. So it's best to keep plumbing to interior walls where possible. And um, if, a, uh, if plumbing needs to be on an exterior wall, it's better to build out a faux wall, you know, some type of chase to run that plumbing into in case there are ever any leaks. And lastly, um, uh, moisture uh, control. So I've got some more information coming in a bit, but a major component is um, straw bale must be covered in a uh, cement, or sorry, in a lime-based plaster, not a cement-based plaster. And the reason for that, for that is there needs to be vapor movement in case the bales ever do get wet, then they need to be able to dry. Um, and that's um, a very key piece. Uh, other pieces around moisture are um, designing um, around that. So here we've got some of the strategies to combat moisture issues. One is, you know, again, no vapor barrier. It needs to be able to breathe. Uh, second, having large eaves, um, just keeping the rain off the, the, the building in general. Um, that's a, a good start. Another is to um, start the bales above the snow line. This is honestly less of a concern, but it was something that the building officials wanted us to do. Um, the, the thinking being that, well, with a standard construction, when homes lose heat, then they can, they end up melting the snow on the exterior. And then when the snow melts, it can get seep into the building. And that could be the risk. The interesting thing with the straw bale is that because there's so so little heat loss, the likelihood of the, the bale or the, the snow melting because of the um, heat loss is, is, is a low risk. Uh, another thing is to never have bales directly on concrete because concrete you know, can wick moisture. So set, setting those up either on toe ups or gravel or um, in our case, these little pony walls is important. Uh, another thing is to make sure that windows sit flush against the wall exterior. Um, again, trying to mitigate having any water pool um, on, you know, on, on horizontal surfaces that could in some way you know, get into the bales below. During construction, a few good strategies are to just toy test the bales for moisture. And we bought a um, you know, moisture meter at um, farm supply stores and uh, made sure that we could test those regularly um, during construction. And um, had, uh, it was a good thing that we had those because sometimes bales got wet. And so we made sure not to use those. Um, uh, but yeah, another key piece is to keeping the bales out of the rain. Um, should, should go without saying. And then lastly, uh, we decided to install moisture sensors. And so this is a picture of me um, installing these little, um, yeah, little white moisture sensors into the walls strategically. We've got them in 10 places throughout the house and they're um, connected to the internet. So my husband's got it on an app um, so he can monitor those. And, um, you know, they're well below the 20% moisture. And so if, but if in, in case any of them do um, trip, you know, we would have to dig into the walls and, and address that just like any, you know, any um, regular home that gets moisture damage, you would have to address it and, and get into the walls. Katie, there's a question in the chat um, mm -hmm. about rice straw. This is back to the slide mm -hmm. we were talking about different straw options uh, and then maybe rice straw might be the best choice. People curious on your thoughts on one particular product over another. Yes, um, so rice straw can have a higher density, which can give it, a, um, has some better insulative uh, qualities. Um, so if you can get it, awesome. Um, it, for me, it was just more an availability thing. I thought it also had like more silica in it and so it's less prone to rotting and that sort of thing. I don't know. I just read that in one place. So who knows, it may not be a widespread belief. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't have the details on that, but um, honestly, if you want to learn more, Andrew Morrison, I direct everyone to kistraw.com. <laughs> he's just he's built with it all, like over 300 homes, um, so his it would definitely be able to answer more of that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So, 
all right. Um, so I'll next move into talking about how we got this project approved. <laughs> um, we had initially, you know, back in like 2018, we were planning on building a, kind of a normal passive house. Um, but when we were getting bids from general contractors, they were all foam based. And that's when we started to go down the straw bale route. Um, we knew though that taking a um, this unique approach would um, uh, potentially give us, uh, be, be more of a challenge in navigating city approvals. I mean, we're, a, a major city, urban area, they like, they have certain rules and regulations and they're very strict on enforcement. So um, we did a lot, working with our architects, we did a lot of research beforehand, had a lot of um, uh, conversations with at least the zoning officials and, and we're made, uh, we're able to get setbacks and variances in order to accommodate, you know, we just, we have wider walls. And so even though our footprint is only, I think it's 24 by 28 interior, you know, that means that we're actually 32 by 28 exterior. And what does that mean for the, the living space? And um, then also like, how does it affect our placement in the neighborhood? Um, so those, those questions are those um, thankfully got resolved and we got approved in February, 2020. Um, we're classified as a cluster development, which I, I don't know that is available everywhere, but it's actually been in Minneapolis for some time, longer than our accessory dwelling unit uh, um, policy. And it allows us, so because we already have a triplex on the site, it allowed us to put a fourth unit um, and to allow for a little bit larger building. The permitting process is where things got really interesting. The building officials, so uh, we started to get our permits in March 2020, and we all know what happened with the pandemic in 2020. The world just totally shut down. So um, basically, building officials didn't want to deal with anything that was different or weird. Um, and so after getting a bunch of no's and no movement for more than four months, um, I organized a meeting with um, uh, as many of uh, decision makers that I could. So my council member happened to be council president, which was very valuable at the time. Um, other council aides who were interested in sustainability um, brought in the building officials, brought in um, Andrew Morrison, and then also brought in the lead author of the Appendix S chapter of the International Construction Code. And it was only through getting this group together could we show the building official that their, the concerns about moisture could be mitigated, that there are best practices around it, um, and that was really key. What they, um, what was interesting in Minneapolis is that there was a build, straw bale building built in 2002, early 2000s, and um, there, it, and it failed. Um, and the only record that I could find of it was a Star Tribune article <laughs> in the the bowels of the internet, and and the, the description showed exactly why it failed. They let the bales get rained on. They covered the bales in plastic um, inside the walls. So just poor practice after poor practice as to why that building failed. And um, so it, anyway, it's just been lore within the, the building um, officials office as to why we should, why the city shouldn't allow straw bale. And so we had to really have conversations to overcome that um, and were able to do so. So moving on to the fun part of the build itself. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we tore down our garage um, in order to put this building here because it's an infill development. We took the solar panels off of our garage, which we will be reusing. So they're now in our basement. Um, we had um, a group that um, now, unfortunately, their name's escaping me. Oh, Better Futures, Minnesota. They um, uh, employ, you know, a former, uh, uh, incarcerated folks and um, have them come to work uh, to do some deconstruction. And so then that weight, that deconstruction waste um, can be sold and reused. So it's kind of a win-win um, for everyone and really enjoyed um, having them a part of this project. After that, um, we put in the foundation. So you can see it got overgrown <laughs> um, a bit and then we dug, dug a giant hole and um, started putting in the footings, so the, the frost footings go down four feet, and then otherwise it's just a slab on grade in the middle. Um, we had, uh, because it's passive house, we wanted to insulate the foundation as well, and that's really critical in our cold climate. Excuse me. At the time when we were doing this, there wasn't any other option than foam. So this was a really 
um, broke my heart a little bit, but we have a bunch of foam under our building, but it will help us um, save operational carbon um, in the future. So then um, the post and beam structure got put up. So you can see we're moving from the first uh, floor, then having the second floor framed up, and then the final um, kind of structure there in that last picture. Um, you'll notice this orange uh, tape, or um, uh, it's a water and air barrier. Um, this is what's helping us get our air sealing. Um, around critical elements. So essentially where, where we have the box beams, where we have the, um, the window boxes, all of those types of things, making sure that we're stopping any little um, uh, air infiltration there. We've got a lot of, of kind of redundancy, um, making sure that we're, we're really addressing that, that air uh, movement. All right, so moving into the straw piece. Um, so we had to go procure straw. Where did we get it? We got 650 bales from a farmer in Frederick, Wisconsin. I found them on Facebook Marketplace and we loaded up three um, uh, uh, semi-trailers and brought them to Uptown. <laughs> and so then I had 12 friends help us unload them and put them in our backyard. They uh, literally took up every square inch <laughs> of the back of our property. So you can see they took up the entirety of the inside of the building as well. And I think I may have some other pictures of the exterior. Um, 650 bales is a lot of bales. Uh, <laughs> so that's where we, we stored that. We tried, wanted to store as many of them inside the building as possible to again, um, keep them out of the rain. And then the ones that are on the exterior, we, we covered in tarps. And here is our moisture meter um, to uh, test the bales. You can see this one's at 11, 11% or so. Uh, so in October, 2021, uh, we got to set our first bale. So that's me putting our first bale in on the first row. Uh, and then Andrew Morrison there on the left um, uh, teaching. So we've got a bunch of people behind him um, teaching how to do, um, put in the bales um, and where you need to cut and how, um, I think he's talking about like the pillowing of the bales. They kind of fluff out at the ends. And so we end up taking um, chainsaws to those to, to kind of cut off those, those pillows. So um, I'll now step through the three main steps of how to do straw bale, of setting the bales, meshing and sewing um, the walls, and then plastering. So it's, it's really a, it, it's not rocket science putting these buildings together. It's just a lot of labor. Um, and that's probably why you don't see more of it. Um, it's just, it's a, there's, there's not a lot of mechanized um, components to it. You can see here, um, my sister, as well as my husband in the middle, um, Andrew's on the right there, uh, far right. They're learning how to tie the specific knot um, for, for bales. We unfortunately had um, bales that had short straw um, so this, uh, yeah, it gets a little bit to the straw uh, conversation. The downside of having short stalks is that they don't, you know, intertwine very well. And so the bales get kind of loose. We ended up having to retie all of our bales because they were so loose and not very compact. It made it, you know, you think about if, 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 you're, if you're putting bricks, you know, in a wall, if you're working with bricks that are solid versus ones that are made out of like Play-Doh, like that's, that's kind of the difference between the two. So we got really, really good at that knot. So for baling, um, a couple of things. Um, you set bales in a wall, similar to how you lay bricks in a wall. Um, so it's a running bond. Um, and we needed to notch uh, all of, so notch the bales where we were coming up into those posts um, and beams. So you can see we cut, you know, around these four by fours um, in order to get those in. And here's kind of a, a view of the first row um, on the side. So I mentioned the depillowing, retying, tamping. Um, so you can see here, we've got a volunteer who's who's cutting um, a notch um, and I'll, she also then on this uh, perpendicular edge um, takes off the little fluffy pillows. Um, retying, you really, it's a lot of uh, using your body weight to, to compress those, those bales. And then once the bales are in the wall, you wanna get them uh, the walls as straight as possible. You know, some bales may, as they're getting put in, they may shift one way or the other. And so um, you typically have people on one, one side, um, either side, both with tampers saying, hey, nope, this one needs to come in a little bit, this one needs to come out. And that's how we make the bale or the uh, wall straight. 
um, even when the walls have been tamped, um, they need to be cleaned up a bit. So we literally take a weed whacker and, and shave the walls because we wanna make it as nice and smooth as possible. Um, your plasterers will thank you <laughs> when uh, they have then a one um, kind of even plane um, for putting plaster on. And even though we've done all this, our, our walls are wavy and um, you know that's an aesthetic choice as to how much uh, you are okay with having wavy walls versus like being um, a stickler to that, that really smooth um, uh, finish with the weed whacker. One quick straw bale question to Katie. <laughs> um, was the issue with the straw bales that you got the fact that they, the farmer didn't bale them tightly enough or was it the length of the straw itself? Or why Great did that question. Need to happen? Yeah. yeah, it was because of uh, the, the straw itself. Um, I didn't know at the time to ask for or to look for longer stock straw um, until the bales arrived. And then Andrew was like, oh, your your bales are just, they're short straw. I'm like, oh, okay. Would have been nice to know that. <laughs> so, lesson learned. Um, here's just an inside look. Of, of doing some of that work. Um, again, that this wall hasn't been shaved yet. Um, things had, had to kind of progress in um, fits and starts, just depending upon when we had crews available for different things. The, this last piece was us um, putting straw into the, the very, very peaks um, around the windows, because we had to wait for the windows to come in. Um, due to supply chain issues, it took a while for us to get our windows. All right, so meshing and sewing. Um, once the bales are in and the walls are straight and they're shaven, the next piece is to really cinch the wall and make it tight together um, and, and ready for plaster. So the, this wire mesh is, what, is what's really key to ensuring that, that sheer, um, sheer strength. So two by two inch wire mesh is uh, what we put on all the walls and you just you know staple it at the top roll it down and staple it at the bottom and on the sides. Um, you then um, use these giant metal forks, which I had custom made at a um, maker space in Northeast Minneapolis. Um, you basically use those as tensioning forks to make the, 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 the mesh as, as tight as possible. Uh, and then once the, the mesh is on, you use these two, two foot uh, needles to literally sew the walls. So um, <laughs> you, you, you know, uh, take some twine, put it on the end, you push it through. Um, you have another person on the other end, push it back and, um, and then you tie a knot. And that's how you're like really cinching the, the wire mesh to the wall and making it all one solid surface. So also had to have the, the needles made. So if anyone wants to do straw bale, I've got <laughs> materials on loan. <laughs> the last major step is plastering. So we talked about the type of plaster. It needs to be lime-based plaster. Um, and uh, that's just essentially made up of water, sand, and lime. Um, so pretty simple uh, mixture. Um, actually had my council member <laughs> come out and, and help with this. So it was, it was kind of a fun time. Uh, you can see here we did the first layer of plastering on the first floor after doing that, um, just understood the extent uh, of the amount of effort that it would take and we ended up hiring out the rest of the plastering. Um, my main goal was to, to get um, in the community build process to, uh, was to have people experience the straw bale part um, because that was new and interesting. Um, the plastering, um, you know, there are plenty of plaster buildings um, and so didn't want didn't need that to be a part of the community build. So as a result, this is kind of what the interior plaster finish looks like. Um, and, you know, it's a little, it's textured, it's not perfectly straight, and that's um, an aesthetic choice from, from our standpoint. So that's most of the straw bale part. A few other pieces about our building. Um, I've taken this from a couple slides from um, my architects who um, helped put this some things together. Um, so our heating, our, our building is entirely electric. There's no gas line to it. And um, the heating and cooling is supplied by an air source heat pump with a ducted air handler. Um, 
we are, are go, actually going with a Tosset, T-O-S-O-T um, brand, um, just because of supply um, issues um, with Mitsubishi. And um, I actually work at the Center for Energy and Environment. We do a lot of uh, uh, research on cold climate air source heat pumps. And so uh, reached out to folks, our researchers, and was like, hey, have you heard of Tosset? And they're like, yep, that'll be a good brand. So that's what we're moving forward with. Um, we're all, we've also got an energy recovery um, ventilation system, and uh, so that's for HVAC. And then for hot water, um, I would have liked to have gone with a heat pump water heater, but given the space um, that we have in the building, that it didn't make a lot of sense. Um, and so we went with the less efficient option of a tankless electric hot water heater, and um, that's, yeah. We'll get, but we actually only have one instead of two as written here. So where are we at right now? Um, at this point, we are working really on the interior finishes. So we've been painting and working on flooring recently. Um, we're having um, kind of some wood accents, uh, so wood ceiling um, installed. We're doing tile, cabinets, doors, those types of things. So the exterior is pretty much done. All right, so um, want to talk about some of the math that got that went into this, how to fit it all in, and like some of the um, uh, the the things that have led to costs, energy, and carbon. Um, so just <laughs> in terms of like how to fit it all in, uh, I like to use this picture as an analogy. Like we literally had to use like body weight in order to put some bales into the wall, um, which I think is just kind of funny. So what about the costs? Um, I've had people ask, is, is straw bale you know, a less expensive form of building? And yes, the material may be inexpensive, but generally it is, it is not. <laughs> I'll just say that up front, that because this approach is new, I mean, we had to educate, not, or, uh, not just us educate, but our, our, how to educate ourselves, but our architects and our um, builder, like they needed to also understand how straw bale needed to be worked around. How do you fit this in um, to normal schedules? Um, as well as like, how do you work with this material? How, how does it make the, like I actually was just working on the floors earlier. So our walls are not, you can't rely on them necessarily because of the bale part that for them to be um, totally straight. And so you can't base your flooring off of that. Okay. So that's, that that's the, the default. Well, what else can we base our flooring, making sure that that's straight off of? So it's things like that, that like if every time you have to question the decision or think about something else, that's what, you know, drives more time uh, on the project. And then more time just means more money. So that included everything from the architect to the builder to their subs, and then also working with the city um, that just, that all just took more time. And so it's, it's cost more money, unfortunately. Um, but we hope that because of the work that we've done, we've started to pave the, the way for that. And like, you know, being able to talk about our experiences, hopefully we can make it easier and less costly for people going forward. Also, let's say another thing that drove the cost is that we just don't have a lot of staging area. And so because of that, um, it took more trips, more deliveries, um, and just um, less efficiencies with people being able to move around on site because of that. Uh, lastly, the pandemic was not a help. Um, we ended up having to buy wood at the, the, the peak of the market when everyone was trying to build new decks and, and all of that. Um, and then we just ran into supply chain issues um, with our heating system, with um, our windows. Um, the windows actually came from Germany because um, there are no manufacturers in the United States that check the boxes of having tilt turn windows that are triple pane and wood. Um, because I wanted to make sure again, like they could be deconstructed and as natural as possible. So it's not a cheap, cheap building. As far as the energy equation goes, um, we're definitely hitting the mark that we wanted to. Um, so for our building, it's a, about a 70% energy reduction compared to a baseline um, code built building. Um, so we'll have an EUI of about 16. That unfortunately doesn't actually qualify us for passive house certification. Um, and 
that part of that has to do with like our number of occupants, like the number of bedrooms for the square footage that we have. Um, it, there, there's some funky things there, but we will be a net positive energy building um, because of the 30 um, solar panels. It'll be almost um, a 10K kilowatt hour, um, sorry, 10 kilowatt solar array on our roof. Um, for carbon tracking, uh, just kind of a note of uh, where emissions generally come from globally when it comes to construction. Uh, so oftentimes when we in the energy industry talk about carbon, we're mostly talking about it from an operational standpoint, but the embodied carbon is just as important. It's essentially the same um, impact as the operational carbon over the lifetime of a building. So um, we took a look at all of the materials that um, are in our building. And yeah, there are things that, that took carbon um, from creating the wall board, um, from the lime plaster to the metal lath, um, as, as well as the, the foundation, you know, the concrete was a big piece. And so those added carbon, um, but the, uh, the bales actually store carbon. So that then gives us, makes us a carbon negative building overall. So generally, um, feel pretty proud of this project. Um, we've had a number of accomplishments. You know, it's a carbon negative building. It supports a climate friendly lifestyle. Um, we've tried to continue pushing the envelope, um, not just on the, the, the insulation materials, but on a lot of other materials. So trying to avoid glues because glues are fossil fuel based most of the time. Um, so we've avoided plywood in a lot of um, the building by using just one buys, um, you know, for some floor and for ceilings and things like that. Um, so that's how we've avoided glues. We were really trying to focus on um, what my builder calls the noble materials. Um, his, he qualifies them as wood, stone, and metal. I'm going to add straw to those noble materials. Um, it's a highly efficient building, and we've had over 100 volunteers come and work on our building um, in 2021 and 2022. So um, I think it's, yeah, it's been a fun time, and it's been great, like, working with friends, neighbors, people who were just coming to Minneapolis to see if it's a place they wanted to live. They're like, hey, I found this on your website. I'm going to come volunteer for a day. We've uh, got to meet really a lot of cool people, um, architects, uh, professors, um, students. Um, so it's been a fun project. Of course, we've also had a lot of lessons learned. <laughs> um, and uh, so from the design side, a couple of interesting things were that we learned that the triple pane glazing um, is actually more insulative than um, all the wood indoors. So uh, we actually have more glass on our doors um, in a number of places than we have window or than we have uh, wood um, because of that R value, that insulative value. Um, when it comes to thinking about the the solar heat gain that we can get through the um, uh, the windows, there there's a there's more of a benefit um, to having the window rather than the the wood of the door. Um, oh yeah, plumbing is best on the interior. Otherwise, make those two by four, you know, wall chases. No, so there's a number of other design things that I'm, I'm sure our architects would be able to say, but I think those are some highlights. As far as the process goes, you got to advocate for yourself um, when you're doing a kind of a weird project. Um, we learned kind of the difference between ADUs and cluster developments. Uh, that they have different impacts, and um, so can advise people on what they might want to do there. Um, also, it kind of brought up to the question around, um, so I think more and more cities are thinking about, you know, these, these living structures behind the, the primary structure, um, and how should they be treating the fronts of buildings? You know, fronts of buildings, um, cities often treat those uh, differently, wanting more window to wall ratios, um, or just more so that it seems it's, it's more active from the street. Um, but obviously windows cost a lot. And so how can um, the city still meet its goals while um, you know, reducing cost and the, like the amount of window or glass space that is required? Uh, another important thing that we learned was uh, don't use an engineer who typically works on aviation, you know, hangers <laughs> um, for a, a residential structure. Um, because our build was so weird, it was hard for us to find an engineer. And so we found a friend um, to do that. But then that also meant our house is kind of overly engineered. Um, we have hurricane strapping in a number of places. 
um, because he couldn't, there's not enough um, data on the shear strength of, of the plaster wall. So he couldn't use that in his calculations. And that's why for our shear, we have a bunch of hurricane straps. So we're really, we've got a lot of redundancy. And um, so if there's ever a, a, a tornado in Minnesota, you know, I think this will be the only building left standing. Um, as far as the build goes, I mentioned um, long stem straw over short stem. That'll save a lot of time and energy. Um, we also had some uh, some delays with regards to that pony wall that you can kind of see um, down below here. That's that's um, that the bales are are sitting on in the first floor. Um, we had a, had some assumptions on what um, material we could insulate in that or use as insulation in there. We thought it could be um, blown in cellulose, but because of um, uh, moisture concerns, when some hydroscopic modeling was done, um, we had it, it. We had to find some other um, some other ways forward. So that just it caused us some delays and and some extra expense, um, which. Uh, we recommend, you know, avoiding if you can. And lastly, you know, hiring a plaster crew, um, really recommend. Oops, sorry. So, and then improvements for next time, there's probably just a lot of other alternatives for things that we ended up using. Like I now know that there's this uh, glass, um, uh, this fiberglass uh, uh, based um, insulation that can be used under foundations. So that is something that could at least be recycled at the end of its life as opposed to foam. So I would probably use that in a second iteration of this. Um, we had to use two or six millimeter poly underneath the building for radon mitigation. And so, um, you know, that's another piece of plastic if that can be avoided. I'd want to try that. Um, as, as I mentioned, there's that orange membrane everywhere, and it is coming from um, a company that um, is sustainability minded and it tries to use um, good materials in their, um, in their membranes, but it's still, there's still some um, fossil based materials in that. And then is there an alternative to polyester twine? So the, the orange twine that is used in our bales. So I'm probably, yep, yeah, <laughs> got 10 minutes left. So I'll just say thank you and uh, I'm happy to take any other questions you have. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. Um, we did have a bunch of questions towards the end here. Uh, so I don't know if folks just wanted to read them. I think that's fine. I don't know, Karen, if you wanted to start with your question that you had. I can also. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> My question was, um, did you consider solar panels instead of having to go to an electric water heater? Or a supplement. Or a supplement. That's a good question. Um, we always knew we were going to have some type of solar on our roof and we were going to maximize that. We've got a beautiful south facing, south facing um, roof. And um, I think that was just one layer of, complex one layer of complexity too much. Um, my husband works in PV and so he's like, well, we can just power any electricity we use with the solar PV and not do the direct, you know, water or solar to water. So. Okay. Definitely something to look at. We, it was just one thing too many. <laughs> we could ask you about the point of use heaters too. No. Cool. And then Drew, you had a couple questions. If you want to chime in with those. Yeah, sure. Uh, kind of wanted to, uh, curious about some of the detailing um, around the air ceiling for the corners and where the straw bales are meeting up with the. Uh, um, uh, the actual structure of the building. What, what did you use for those? Um, yeah, so it was that orange membrane and I don't remember the name of it off my head, uh, off the top of my head. Um, I would be happy to follow up with you um, if you'd like. <laughs> And then, kind of, kind of on top of that, the the was was a uh, like a uh, vapor permeable barrier required on the outside for code, or is that something that the plaster was uh, sufficient for for water shedding? Yeah, so the plaster was sufficient. Um, there is enough data to be able to um, to give the code officials um, what they need for that. So yeah, the plaster counted there. Um, we are not painting the plaster. Um, although you can, you just have to be careful to make sure that it, it does remain vapor open. 
Um, and we are using paint on the interior on the drywall. Um, I'm using Oro, A-U-R-O. It's a German um, company and the um, paint is all plant derived. Um, so, um, cause my goal is even for the drywall that at the end of its life, you can take off the paper, it can be composted and the, and the, um, the, the, the gypsum of itself be reused. Thank you. Justin had another question in here. Um, I don't know, Justin, if you want to ask that too. Sure, yeah. Katie, great project. Um, I've, I've seen a little bit of uh, straw bale construction just on YouTube, and but nothing locally. So that's props to you guys for <laughs> um, digging in digging into that uh i was wondering what your if you did some energy modeling and what your uh, heating load was on on the house and then just a couple other questions around uh glazing um if you're worried about overheating or um did you implement some strategies to try to combat some of that Yes. Um, so as far as the heat, um, energy calculations, uh, the, you can see some of those numbers here. So we've got a demand of about um, 21 kBTUs per square foot per year. Um, and then the load is about 13 BTUs per hour. Um, so that's what we're expecting. Um, yeah, as far as the glazing, and I mean, we have focused the glazing on the south side um, and, and honestly it's beautiful in like in the in the uh, um, the afternoon um, getting all that sunlight it's very bright um, but yeah the with our eaves we did model um, how we can maximize getting that solar heat gain in the winter time with also needing to protect the bales, you know, and having wide eaves that way. So where we positioned the windows is I think part of that um, was the calculus um, and how big they were. All went into kind of optimizing this, you know, keeping down the heating load um, and, and trying to get that, so that free solar heat gain as, as possible. Let's see, did you have another question there? I was just seeing. No concerns with overheating, really. Um, yeah, and especially in the winter or in the summertime, much less so because of the eaves. You know, the sun will be the just the windows. The, the, the eaves will shade the sun because the sun's so high. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions for Katie as we wrap up? All right, hearing none. Um, thanks, Katie, for this really informative presentation. I certainly learned a lot. Sounds like others did too, and a lot of great questions too from the audience. So thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thanks for having me. And Drew, I'll follow up with that vapor barrier question. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. And I'll follow up with everyone with the slides and the recording afterwards too. So thanks again, Katie, and we'll see you next month, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.